Spanning the nerd world and feeding your fandom. Crash landed. From comics to video games. From the cinematic universe to television. Earth. Connecting you to the biggest stars in the industry. Something out there had discovered us. It's time for the Down and Nerdy Podcast. Here's your host, James Witham. Spending a little time in the present this week and a little time in the past. It's episode 332 of the Down and Nerdy Podcast. I'm James Witham. Happy Labor Day weekend to you if you're in the States, if wherever you are. Hey, hopefully it's a great weekend for you as well. Big show this week, actually. A bunch of interviews to share with you. So, so excited this week to be joined by the cast of Raised by Wolves, a series which you can now stream on HBO Max. Got four amazing cast members for you. I'll reveal those here for you in a couple minutes. Also, finally, 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 getting a chance to share my interview with Jun Yu, who plays cricket on the Mulan movie, which you can now see for premiere access on Disney+. Plus. So maybe you're already doing that right now. Maybe you haven't had a chance to do it yet. You'll get to hear from Jun Yu about his experience on the set. You are not going to want to miss that. Plus, you know, we still got some comic book reviews to talk about and a whole bunch more. But let's start things off, by the way, with four amazing cast members from HBO Max's Raised by Wolves. There's a little bit of a warning, maybe a few spoilers involved in these interviews, too. Let's get to them next on the Down and Nerdy Podcast. This is April Bowlby from DC's Doom Patrol, and you're listening to the Down and Nerdy Podcast heard me talk about it on the podcast before it is finally here the new hbo max series from ridley scott and company called raised by wolves and some of the very talented cast actually joined me for a virtual press event recently thanks to the folks at hbo max and warner brothers entertainment and the first two talented people to join me from that series is travis fimmel who of course plays marcus on the series, and then we also have Naim Alger, who plays Sue, and they are together, and you'll see that when you see the series on HBO Max, which is out right now. But the first question for that I had for them was, you know, this isn't really your first, your typical sci-fi series. What did you think about that when you first got on set? It's pretty obvious really early on that this series is not your typical sci-fi series. So did you all kind of get that sense as well? when you first stepped on the set? Oh, for sure. I've never been involved in a sci-fi, but I was blown away with what Ridley has visualized and, and created. You know, he's an extraordinary um, talent and um, he's always trying to be a cutting edge and, and the stuff on it that I've never seen even in any sci-fi stuff that I've, uh, I've seen. He's just so... He never wants to repeat himself. And it was amazing to work in an environment like that. The next question for Travis and Name was, you know, they are a couple in a wartime setting. What's that like? And hey, what's it like going up against androids? Name and I had a sexual relationship before we started. <laughs> uh, uh, our characters have been together for many, many years. I think what's great about the show is when we're thrown into, which the audience will be thrown into it too, thrown into this new world and, and our relationship is really tested. And I think that's where a lot of the, for us, that's where a lot of the drama comes and and for the audience, um, I think they'll wonder if we're going to be able to stay together or stick together and what's going to happen to our relationship. But it's uh, it's certainly a world you get thrown into. Yeah, I think that what Aaron had created is a very complex relationship. It's it's uh, like, like uh, Travis said, it's like these people have been together for a long time. So they have that history and then they have the new task of creating this new identity and how that would change, I think, their own relationship and how they are kind of feeling towards each other. Because it's interesting, it's such an interesting uh, idea to the, the idea that visually you fall in, in love with someone and then all of a sudden the next day or, you know, you're f- faced with trying to make a connection with a brand new face of, of someone else that, that you know, that is a stranger to you. And, but deep down, it's, it's the connection those two people would have had kind of ingrained in them and and how that then is challenged through the course of the series so it's uh but yeah Travis was a he was great to work with and he's a he's a he's a trickster he always kept the scenes interesting that's for sure hey Travis Maeve it was a pleasure to work with you every day I look forward to getting up to spend time with you yeah 
The next question for Travis and name was actually the uniqueness of the uniform. She talked about that. Not only that, but what is the object of their quest? And maybe does it change over time? I just thought this answer was really interesting. Check it out. I think both characters have had to spend their whole life. And, uh, and Marcus was a, a child soldier. The whole life just trying to um, survive. I don't think he's ever had a chance to, my character has never had a chance to um, have goals or dreams or or imagine imagine a better world for himself. I think he's just spent his whole life trying to survive and now he's on a, a new virgin planet trying to do the same thing. Uh, and then he's very flawed in his in the way that he relates to people a lot of the time because of his upbringing. And um, sometimes I feel bad for Neve's character because I'm not the best husband in the world. Although I love her dearly. <laughs> and she's a great cook. <laughs> you cook you cook that in that scene. You cook the rat in that. Oh, no, I do. Sorry, my bad. I do. We had an incredible, like, Janty Yates, who designed the costumes on this with, with Ridley. It's... Um, aesthetically it's unlike anything that I had seen and when you you when you're putting on those costumes you're kind of it's like you're putting on an armor um which is an armor in which these these people have around them they're incredibly guarded because of uh the way in which they're they're raised and especially for for Travis's character he's he's a he's a child soldier so he has it's ingrained in him to to protect kind of like you know himself and the the, the vulnerability is trying to get that through but you, yeah Travis had an incredible coat as well um that I was very jealous of I, I actually coffee. made that coat myself did you yeah you you were wasted in acting Travis I kind of agree I was a great seamstress <laughs> <laughs> when you watch Raised by Wolves on HBO Max, you'll find out that there's some serious religious themes in this thing. So my last question for Travis and Name was to talk about those religious aspects and how they kind of balance both sides in the show. Uh, this show has a lot of really big religious aspects to the story, especially early on. So how did you both feel like the series kind of balanced the beliefs on both sides, both of the androids and the humans? Oh, that's a good one, Name. I think it's like from when you're looking at it from the Android's point of view is that they have been programmed to be neutral in 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 all in in as a as a religious aspect of it. So I think in which the way in which the show portrays that you know it's it's you can't deny the way that you know we live in a very in an unfortunate time where you know people are discriminated for their religious belief. But I think this is a fictional world that is bringing aspects of that into it, and yeah. Now seems like a pretty good time to bring in those androids because I was also joined by Amanda Collin, who plays mother, and Abu Salim, who plays father on Raised by Wolves. And the first question for them is was actually really good on how they played emotion without emotion in playing androids on the series. Listen to what they had to say. I I think it was it was I don't know if it was a challenge. It felt exciting. The idea of um, almost feeling for the first time and trying to portray that I think that was what was really exciting about the you know playing this AI playing this AI who is programmed to be a parent so that must mean you must feel empathy and be nurturing what does that mean how does that feel if your child does something that you don't want them to do and it's it was that was what was really you know it was it was it was exciting exploring that because there was no right or wrong way of doing it it only it was it just was and i think that was um something that i uh, again that was so brilliant about again the world that was you know presented to us anyway yeah and so much was given also with the suits i think it was a big help too because we looked so androidy so we had the freedom to play more emotion without it being human but we, it was a fine line and sometimes it was too emotional and then you turn it down or, I mean, I, I think all my <laughs> scenes are so emotional because it's emotional stuff mother is going through all the time. Because like we're, we're sort of teenagers, we're discovering who we are while we're raising kids and it's such an interesting territory. And so much brilliant stuff to play with, you know, like, when Speria dies, 
there's a grief in mother, both because of losing a, a child or the last girl, but also because of her failure in her mission. And I think that was so interesting to play with because she's programmed to do something and she keeps failing to, to play with that. And that might look like just regular grief or whatever but i think there was so many layers that we could play with and pull up and work on that it made it just like the most interesting characters to work with ever so my questions for abu and amanda were about the different parenting styles of mother and father as androids and i think you'll like their answer James from the Down and Nerdy Podcast, thank you so much for you guys uh, taking the time today. Obviously, there's many different ways to raise children. So how would you describe mother and father's parenting style? Mother destroys people. Father tells jokes. Yeah, <laughs> that sums it up. That's, uh, <laughs> yeah, I think, I think it's, I think, I guess it's, it's, you know, there's no really right or wrong way of raising children. And I think that's what is interesting about mother and father's sort of you know discovery and, and play of that you've got you know father on one end trying to teach the children you know how to survive or or how to to sort of cope and manage you've also got mother teaching them about education about the you know about the world before and how you know the mistakes not to make so i think it's it's one of those things which is just constantly adapting and evolving with the children Right. And I think it becomes very interesting when, you know, in, the, in sort of the first episode where we have our original children and the original children are new, they're fresh, they're, they're of this world. And then now after, you know, after the event of, of, of almost, you know, losing them, you then have to then deal with raising children who are coming already with history and with the baggage. And that then evolves how you are supposed to raise them. And it's, yeah, it's, it's a, it, it's, there's no one way of putting it. It's, it's just constantly evolving. Awesome, I don't know thank if you. you can hear a crying child in the background, but that's pretty much how I raise <laughs> I mean, there you go. That's how, how Amanda raise raises her children. <laughs> <laughs> Finally, you heard Abu mention about jokes. Well, yeah, there's dad jokes that are a part of this series. And who knew that an android could tell dad jokes, right? So the last question that was asked was about, you know, how Amanda felt being on the receiving end of said dad jokes from Abu and just how fun that was in general. Check it out. I mean, she loved it. I'll answer that for her. She loved it. <laughs> like, <laughs> no, I think for me, you know, I, it was, it's funny, right? Dad jokes are like so awkward and so weird and they come at the most awkward times. And what, what I really discovered was the fact that they are, they, they, they are designed to relieve some weird tension. So for example, like, you know, father's giving jokes right after mother massacred an, an entire ship. So it's like, okay, that's the, you pick your moments, mate. And it, and it seems to work. So I feel like, yeah, it definitely, um, it's, it's definitely a tool in which I'm definitely going to keep, you know, in my back pocket, you know, in the future when I start having children, it's just throw a dad joke there when the world is ending. <laughs> it's, it's, also, don't underestimate the power of, of lightening things up, you know? You use them so clever, and I think, you know, with um, Hunter, when he's, like, being a smartass, you know, that's a clever way of using yeah. the dad joke. And I think, I genuinely think they were fun. I mean, I was laughing, like, I was laughing, for real. And every time I watch the episodes, I cannot help texting Abu, like, I am so in love with you, because... <laughs> My, the dad jokes are my favorite part, too. Oh. Yeah. You know, that's one of the things that surprised me about this show, Raised by Wolves, was that y you know how serious it was. You know how steep in sci-fi it was going to be. I didn't expect it to be funny in parts, though. And, and Abu hits the nail right in the head. It's awkwardly funny. That is one of the best parts about it. So, I mean, you got to see... Raised by Wolves. It's streaming now on HBO Max. You will not be sorry that you did the first three episodes, and then they're going to come weekly after that. I mean, I cannot wait for you guys to see what's coming. And I, I just have to prepare you mentally for that first episode. It is a freaking ride and a half. I will just look, just prepare you mentally for that right now. It is that good, and it is that intense once again thank you so much to everybody at hbo max and everybody who joined me from raised by wolves 
this week, Travis Fimmel, Amanda Collin, Abu Salim, and also Name Alger as well. Just an amazing cast, and I cannot wait for you guys to see what they do. So yeah, if you don't have HBO Max, now would be a good time. Let me tell you that right now. That's going to do it for my interviews with the cast of Raised by Wolves. Up next, speaking of streaming, got the first few episodes of The Boys. And yeah, let's dive into that for a little bit. Maybe spoiler free this time. Next on the Down and Nerdy Podcast. Hi, this is Sean Ryan. And I'm Eric Kripke. And we're the creators of Timeless on NBC. And you're listening to the Down and Nerdy Podcast. The boys are back and maybe better than ever. Who knows? That's right. Amazon actually was a little bit tricky this week and dropped the first three episodes of The Boys a little bit early, actually a day early. So fans, because fans just couldn't wait anymore. And the first three episodes of season two available now, of course, the rest are going to come out weekly. And and I got to tell you, these first few episodes, since they just, as of me recording this, they've just come out. So I'm going to go ahead and give some spoiler free thoughts on the boys, maybe I'm, maybe that's a little bit of a bummer for you, but I'm not going to spoil it for anybody that hasn't had a chance to see it already, right? So, so I'm going to be fair here, no spoilers for my early season two review of the boys. But I will tell you, but basically what you've been seeing in the trailers and the clips and stuff like that, that's what's happening. It's it's the boys, and they are on the run or in hiding, however you want to describe it. They are being hunted by pretty much everyone because remember the public still loves the soups. The public still has no idea about who the soups really are, okay? So they still are loved by the public. The boys are considered terrorists, and it's a crazy ride. Where they're hiding out is super, super interesting and super shady, too, by the way. And and everyone's attitude is different about their situation. Obviously, nobody th- obviously thinks they're in a good situation here, but I think it's interesting how they're all handling it while they're in hiding. And obviously, in the beginning, you know about Butcher's absence. I don't have to tell you about that. That's not a spoiler. It's also not a spoiler that he comes back, and sooner than you would think, too, by the way. And the reaction to him coming back, too, is also different from everybody. You've actually seen that in one of the clips where he, that is when he's he's coming back sort of thing. So it's just interesting how everybody reacts. The one thing that stood out to me the most in these early episodes is how different Starlight is. That was one thing that really, really jumped out at me. And you kind of see Aaron Moriarty, who plays Starlight, sort of make that turn late in season two. But at this point, she's like, she's fed up, right? She's been pushed enough, and she's just very, very, very different. Her tactics are different as well. You'll understand what that means when you actually... Watch the episodes. You've seen the clip where she confronts the, the deep in the set. That, that's the second episode, actually, of C, of season one when she confronts when she confronts deep, who tries to half-heartedly apologize to her, and she basically tells him that there's no way in hell he's getting back into the seven. And and the, she, that's the kind of stuff that you're going to expect from her. But there's a few things that she does in these first few episodes that I think are going to surprise you a lot. And I, th- I wonder if it's going to change your opinion of her a little bit. Or maybe it'll make you like her even more. I guess it depends on your perspective. One of the other things that really jumped out at me is, obviously, since Homelander burned out you know, the eyes of the last head of Vought, we need new leadership of Vought, right? And I think you'll be surprised as to who that new leadership is chosen by Homelander, too, by the way. And somebody gets a real bite of her, out of a reality sandwich about Homelander in this season, too. I don't know if uh, she was expecting it, but she absolutely does. But let me tell you what. This is one of the reasons why I love Giancarlo Esposito. I'm just going to throw that out there right now. He is a big part of what happens with Vought. And the way that he approaches things. And just this, y- you don't expect this guy to have any fear anyway. I don't think I've ever seen him play a character that's afraid of anything, quite frankly. And if, if you have, please clue me in because I don't think I've ever seen the dude play a character that, that is that way. It, the way that he approaches things with Vought is so interesting. And he is not afraid to stand up to anyone. There is a very tense scene in the second episode. I believe it's the second episode between his character Stan and Homelander. It is amazing. I cannot wait 
for you guys to see it. But and let me and maybe you've already seen it and you know exactly what I'm talking about. It's just it's it's very interesting how the things are the same but very very different at Vought at the same time. You, you almost feel like they're more evil. That's kind of how I felt when I was going through things. But I mean, as far as new characters go, it's hard for it's hard to not say that that Aya Cash is Stormfront doesn't steal the show as a new character the way that she had her zero filter attitude that she brings to things is is so is so fits in this show and anybody that's going to give homelander a hard time i'm cool with that too so anybody that wants to give homelander a little bit of a tough a tough go yeah i'm gonna enjoy that extensively so yeah she she definitely brings a different flavor to the mix of the seven, no question about it. And you could certainly understand why somebody would want her on the team because she would bring a lot of attention and a lot of likes. Apparently, you've seen that clip too. You've seen that in the in the clip that they released. I believe it was a Comic Con at home or one of the one of the events where they were they were releasing a clip about introducing us to Stormfront, where she's got a good social media following. And hey, in this day and age, that kind of thing matters. So it's just if you loved season one of The Boys. This is going to be like, you know, an old friend that you haven't seen in a while. Like, like you know, we're all allowed to do stuff again once this pandemic slows down or, or ends or however this is going to go when we get back to our normal lives. You finally get to, you know, actually meet people again and go out in person and, you know, give people hugs and things like that. That's what this season feels like. It feels like the return of an old friend that you haven't seen in a while that you have just been dying to see ever since and that's exactly how season two of the boys feels it was just so good i mean homelander is exactly what you'd expect you know butcher exactly what you'd expect huey paranoid as ever gotta love that if your mother's milk still exactly who he is frenchy and and still very protective of of, Kim, of kimiko and she comes a long way too in these first few episodes too by the way i really really loved how they did that as well, but this show does just such a great job of explaining where where it's at, where it's going, and just putting all the right pieces in all the right places. Eric Kripke and company, you can understand just by watching these first few episodes how Amazon could see this and go, "Well, we've got to have a season three. This is obviously going to be a huge smash hit. We are one hundred percent having a season three and if and as my reaction that was my reaction after one episode never mind three of them so yeah if you were worried at all that the boys would be able to live up to the season one hype don't worry trust me this show has been worth the wait and you are going to love every single second of these first few first few episodes of season two of the boys and they are back and i'm gonna say it better than ever i think these first few episodes of season two might be better than the first few episodes of season one. There, I said it, don't at me. It's all great. I just think that season two definitely kicks it up a notch in the early going. That's going to do it for my spoiler-free review of season two of The Boys, the first few episodes anyway that are released right now on Amazon Prime Video. Up next, it's time to talk to Jun Yu, who plays cricket on the Mulan movie available now on Disney+. Plus. Let's talk to him next. I'm James Witham, and this is the Down and Nerdy Podcast. Hey, this is Nelson Lee from DC Stargirl, and you're listening to the Down and Nerdy Podcast. The wait is finally over, and it feels like forever, doesn't it? Mulan is finally here, available. Premier Access on Disney Plus right now, and if you had a chance to see it yet, you know that he is a part of it. He plays cricket on this new live-action adaptation, talking to John Yu. John, how you doing? Hey, man, how you doing? I'm doing great. Now, you're a relative newcomer to Hollywood, actually, and, you know, you've been in a few things, and I heard that Mulan, though, was actually, like, your first professional audition. What was it like kind of swinging for the fences on such a big project? Oh, man. When I got the call to do the audition, I, you know, it was my first thing, so I didn't really know what to expect, and so I just did the work. I went in, did the audition, and then just been getting callbacks, and then eventually just got the role, and it's it's been nice. It's been crazy. Now, how familiar were you with Mulan, the Mulan story, before you actually auditioned for the role? Oh, that was my that was my favorite uh, Disney movie. I think I was born around the same time. I was born ninety seven, but it was like near then. So it was like maybe the first one of the first Disney films I've ever even seen. 
That's pretty awesome. Now, with this being a live-action adaptation, something Disney's, Disney's been doing a lot lately, the assumption's pretty much that you won't be a tiny little cricket on the screen. So, other than the <laughs> no. obvious, what would you say is the biggest difference between your cricket and the original? Well, the biggest difference would probably be me being a human being now. Yep, that's, that's um, a good one. Uh, yeah, so he's walking on two legs instead of six, four. I don't know how many legs crickets have, <laughs> but... Uh, that's pretty much pretty much the biggest difference. Everything else I pretty much embody from the original. So it's pretty, yeah, it's pretty much same but different, you know? What, what is that like, though? Because that can't be an easy thing be like, okay, so you were an insect, now you're not. Go. Yeah, yeah. I mean, in the script, it's just him as a person. So it's not really them taking it from, you know, the animated film. I mean, it was just, he's a human being, so it's just easy to really connect with the emotions and everything like that and everything he would feel in wartime. Most definitely. Now, we know that in the animated version that Mulan and Cricket are very close for obvious reasons, so how much can you tell us about how close they are in this in this iteration? I wouldn't say, I can't say much, but I wouldn't say that we are, like, besties in that sense. I pretty much joined the, the like, the group. We're just, like, one big family. So it's not like... I'm by her side 24-7, <laughs> like in the animated, but I'm there. I'm there with her. And that's all that matters. Somebody's got to be there. Awesome. So that, that's Absolutely. good to hear. That's good to hear. Now, in the animated movie, of course, I'm sure, which you're, you're obviously very familiar with, Cricket kind of, kind of started as a good luck charm from Mulan's yeah. grandmother. So I have to ask, do you have any good luck charms of your own? I do. I do. Cricket still embodies that luck. He himself is lucky. I don't really bring luck to anyone else. But um, there are some close close things that uh, you'll notice that, you know, is he's still got the luck in him. Interesting. It's interesting. We're talking to Jun Yu, of course, plays Cricket in the Mulan live-action movie, which you can see from Walt Disney Pictures. Now, Jun, one thing we know for sure about this movie based on the trailer is just how visually stunning that it will be. What was it like being on set, not just with the costume designs, but the locations you were shooting in as well? I still dream about these locations. It's really like... You ever see like a Windows like desktop screensaver? It's pretty much you're living that in real time in all these locations. It's just to see some of this. I, I really never thought I'd dream to see these places. And it was amazing. Places where barely any human beings have touched. And I've been blessed to have lived and breathed that air, you know? <laughs> Definitely. And, you know, obviously we've also seen from the trailers there's going to be some epic battle scenes in this movie. It's, there's war. I mean, there's no certainly no doubt about that. Seeing them on the screen is one thing because, I mean, there's certainly been some epic battles in movies over the years. What's it like to kind of see that in real time, like you're a part of this thing? How vast is it from, like, a personal point of view? It, it's a little, uh, it's different. Um, it's definitely not the same as if you see it uh, on the screen because of, like, how they're shooting it and the angle so sometimes the fights can look a little awkward but the people are moving like all these fights and every stunt that they're doing it's all them and it's insane i needed a double so i couldn't do it but there's a lot of things that was amazing yeah that's incredible now we know that mushu and cricket had a very close relationship in the animated version but director nikki Kara said that Mu that mushu will not be a part of of this movie now without spoiling anything how do you feel like this movie deals with that absence oh amazingly i really think i mean this film is just so different uh from the animated because this is all it all ties around like the original ballad of mulan mulan was like originally a ballad so i mean you won't really miss him you just know that you know he was there in the animated but she does really well there's there's so many different things in this this film that mushu could never bring and it's so special, and this film is going to be so good, and I can't wait for everyone to see it. Do you feel like different is kind of a good thing, too? Because, you know, a lot of times when you're seeing stuff going from animation to live action, you know, you have got some diehard fans of the original that want to see that. But do you think in this particular instance, different is a good thing and really works out for this movie more than others? Oh, amazingly. I, I really, I mean, storytelling is that. Like, you don't want to know what the ending is, or you don't want to know, you know, the whole thing. So it's a little difficult to do, you know, these live actions and do it the same. So I really feel that this in particular, because we're doing it differently, it's, it changes the entire game. It's so good. Now, this version, speaking of different, this version Mulan actually introduces a new villain, a villain which is a wish named Jean Lang. Now, 
We have seen only a small sample of what she's capable of in the trailer, so I'll ask you just how scary is she? She's she's just mysterious. I wouldn't say she's you know scary, but I can't really say too much about her to be honest. But she's amazing. Gong Li, who plays the witch, is phenomenal and a sweetheart, and I love her. Well, speaking of that, let's expand on that a little bit. Talk about your cast and how amazing it was to be a part of this group, and just how it was being on set with everyone. Oh God, I wow, this is yeah, it was it was incredible. I mean, just to see Jet Li, just to see Donnie, just to you know see all these people that I've seen like kind of growing up. It's incredible, and to breathe the same air, to work on the same thing, it's. It still feels like a dream. It's honestly crazy. So as a newcomer, did you kind of get to pick their brain a little bit? And if so, what what was the best piece of advice that you got while you were while you were chatting with them? <laughs> no, uh, I didn't. I didn't want to go and annoy them with a bunch of questions. But we, we definitely <laughs> hung around. I mean, like I'm I'm 22, and they're you know they've been in the business. So I don't want to like, hey man, what was it like to you know do all this and you know what should I do here? I you know they they pretty much have just acted like big brothers and just by doing their work i have learned so much through them not that they gave me any advice but seeing them you know set the examples it's been it's been crazy so i learned a lot of like set etiquette and this that and the third it's, it's amazing visual learning is important june very important yeah yeah there you go there you go now i was also told that you are a rapper in your downtime and you're actually working on some new music right now, so I'm just going to go ahead and spoil it right now. I mean, clearly the post credit scene for Mulan is a cricket freestyle, right? Yeah, 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 absolutely. Uh, Nikki definitely gave me the time to get the mic and rap about a bunch of nonsense. <laughs> <laughs> but no, um, it's, yeah, music's coming on the way. It's been something I've been doing ever since I was like 10, but I just haven't wanted to release it just, just yet. I mean, there's a lot of opportunities for musical roles out there. Something that's something you're gonna be looking into at some point. Oh no, 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 no! Don't, I don't want you to get it twisted. I, I cannot sing for the <laughs> life. I cannot. That's why I'm rapping. You know, um, but it's good. It's good. I think I think that there's definitely you'll see more of my projects and stuff like that soon. Awesome. Now, June, before I let you go, looking back on your experience shooting this movie and being a part of this just massive undertaking. Is there one memory that kind of sticks out for you the most? If you you know if you were to look back on this five ten years later, oh man, there's just so many memories, and I couldn't really pick one out. But all of the times I think that like after, oh you know what I did I do remember one. I think it's pretty much when they told me I was uh, wrapped, like I was done. This was my last scene and everything like that. And as soon as you know we finished this one last scene, I broke down crying. It was just because it was just such a roller coaster and it's such an adventure and for it to all come to an end. And it was, it was happy tears, not like sadness, but it was just so beautiful to be a part of it and just be with a lot of people who love acting and love storytelling. And it was just phenomenal. So I think that will always stick by me of how I'm crying utterly and so ugly in front of everyone. Well, you can find out what there is to chirp about because Mulan is available right now. Premiere access on Disney Plus if you want to watch it right now. And you will see this guy and all of his hijinks and all the big battles that he's a part of. It's June Yu. Thank you so much for joining me this week. Thank you so much for having me, man. Thank you. This is comic book writer Jackson Landon, and you're listening to the Down and Nerdy Podcast. Whether you're popping open some bags and boards or popping the hood on the old laptop, whatever you're reading on, it's time for what we're reading. And if there's a new Hellblazer book, you know I am going to grab it. It is Hellblazer Rise and Fall number one from DC's Black Label. How about Tom Taylor writing John Constantine and Derek Robertson on the art? You'd grab that, wouldn't you, just based on that alone? Diego Rodriguez on the colors. And Darren Bennett on the letters. Going to do some spoilers here because this book has been out for a few days now. And one of the things I really liked about it, actually, was that it was a more personal take on John Constantine. We, we You know, you see a lot of magic. You see a lot of wise-assery when it comes to John, right? You see some, you know, some backstabbing, some typical John Constantine things. But this one gets personal, like on a deeply personal level, because we get to see how much guilt really plays a role in John Constantine's life. And, you know, here's your first spoiler. You know, his mother dies after childbirth. Now, it looks like mom's fine, but then, you know, obviously something happened to where 
she passed away. And then, of course, dad was a prick. And then he, you know, he runs off. He does exactly what dad tells him not to do. And he ends up being responsible for the death of one of his friends as well. I mean, responsible. You know, they were all there. You you, you can draw whatever conclusion you like as to how responsible he actually was for his friend's death. But you see where he carries that burden with him throughout everyday life. And this there's a huge time jump after that in this book. And we get to see one of his other friends that was well, that was there that same night of the of the tragedy who is now an, an investigator. Right. She's a police officer of some kind. And they are investigating a series of killings with some very interesting circumstances. Not going to spoil what those circumstances are. That that one I won't do. But, you know, and then she gets reunited with John because obviously these circumstances are not normal because when John Constantine shows up, nothing normal ever happens. So, you know, they get a chance to reconnect and be friends. And then you find out that it's like this com this combination, them coming back together was almost like fate because of who else or what else, I should say, is involved potentially in this case or something that's about to come up in their lives. And it seems like somebody's always after John Constantine, living or dead. Somebody's always after John. And that is exactly what's happening in this story. And there's a lot more to it than that. But this is, again, it's a deeply personal story about John Constantine. That's something we don't really get very often. There's a lot of stage setting in this in this book, though. I will tell you that much right now. There's a lot of setup. It's kind of like, but you almost have to do that because you're creating a different vibe around John Constantine. You have to sort of set that stage a little bit, right? You, you kind of have to, you know, lay the groundwork a little bit. And I think Tom Taylor and company do a great job. And I got to tell you, the, the way that Derek Robertson's art pops out in this in this book, it's absolutely Stunning. I mean, you kind of almost get that vibe of him from when he was working on The Boys when you work on this Hellblazer book. I'm not saying that, you know, anybody looks like a character from The Boys, but it's just, it's very palpable in some of the facial expressions and things like that. Unconsciously, I'm sure, by Robertson, but it just seemed very, very, I definitely got that spark. And the whole vibe of the book was just so different for me. And as somebody who's read a lot of John Constantine's stories, it was kind of refreshing to see one that took a little bit of a different angle. And then you give me that reveal at the end, which I will not reveal for you and find out who else is going to be a part of this book. And the way that character was designed, I am so freaking in for this. You have no idea. Put this one in my pull box forever. That is Hellblazer Rise and Fall, number one from DC's Black Label. Speaking of different takes, how about Black Widow number one, the 2020 edition from Marvel Comics as well that came out this past week. And we've got Kelly Thompson on the writing here, Elena Casagrande on the art, Jordi Belair on the colors, VCs Corey Pettit on the letters, and Adam Hughes doing the cover for this one. And this is, again, we'll do some spoilers here because this book's been out for a little bit now. It's, you know, Romanoff being Romanoff, right? She's doing her spy thing. She's out on a mission. That's how things start out. And it seems like everything's going just fine. You know, she's had a little spat with Hawkeye, but, you know, that's just something that'll eventually go by the wayside, right? You know, they'll make up sort of thing. You know, she's just gotten back from a from a mission with Bucky not too long ago. And then, you know, it seems like things are going to be back to normal, right? Like anything's, or, anything's ever normal for Black Widow in her life. You know, she thinks she's just going to be able to go home. Well, that's not necessarily the case. And then something happens that completely changes things. And again, we get a time jump in this book as well. Not quite as much though, only three months. And then what we get to see is a completely different Natasha Romanoff. You want to talk about a great fish out of water type story. This is it. So far, and the thing about it is, is that we barely scratched the surface, but the change is so dramatic for me. It was almost like an eye popping type of situation. It's like putting a character that you would never expect to be in real life into real life. And it was such a shock to the system that, you know, I had to like, you know, like in cartoons, you know, like they kind of like rub their eyes and stuff like that and, and, you know, blink them a few times just to make sure you're seeing something. 
that's there right in front of you. That's how I felt when I was reading the latter half of this book. And then, of course, you know that there's going to be more to it than that, right? It's not like she quits her job and decides to, you know, just do some something that's sort of mundane and, and you know, by any other standards. So it's it's not as cut and dry as all that. There's something much more that's going on here. And there's certainly a couple of people that we see in this book that are hell-bent on getting to the bottom of this thing. Now, who's responsible for this? You know, we get a little bit of a tease at the end of the book. I'm not going to spoil that for you. But it's up to you to decide whether or not what you're seeing from Black Widow as a Black Widow fan, is this a good thing or a bad thing in the grand scheme of things? That's a question that you're actually going to have to ask yourself based on this character's history. And that'll make a heck of a lot more sense when you pick up this book. This is such. This is actually laid out really, really well. There's a there's a fight scene right towards the beginning of this book. First of all, Jordi Belair. I don't know how she does this with reds, but it's it's like red is her color. And anytime there's red on the page, Jordi Belair finds a way to make it masterful and just dr- bring me right the freak in. Anytime I read anything that she colors, just an amazing job. But the way that the panels were laid out for that fight scene, and you'll know what I'm talking about when you read it, is, is was just mesmerizing. I was so caught up in the art in that page. I mean, the art in the rest of the book too, is good, too. Don't get me wrong, but that, that particular scene was pretty dynamite. I really, really enjoyed it. And again, this this just felt like a different Black Widow story. That doesn't mean that you won't get some, you know, if you're a Black Widow fan, it's not doesn't mean you're not going to get what you're hoping for, you know, certain classic Black Widow moments. You're going to get that. But at the same time, this story is going to take things in a much different direction. And, I mean, as many stories as we've had for Black Widow, is that necessarily a bad thing? I don't think it is. Plus, we're going to get to see two other characters work together that you might not think might would work together very well as far as their personalities go. And I'm very interested to see where that dynamic goes. Go ahead and throw this one in my pull box, too. Why not? This is a couple of books you should definitely be adding to your collection. That's going to do for what we're reading. Up next, some nerd news that might make Star Wars fans a little upset. Maybe. We'll find out next on the Down and Nerdy Podcast. This is Joe Henderson, showrunner for Lucifer, and you're listening to the Down and Nerdy Podcast. Something has been awakened, and it's certainly not the Force. It's time for nerd news. And here's a story that popped up towards the end of the week that has caused a lot of chatter on social media, and that is an interview that John Boyega had with British GQ talking about his experience on be, you know being in Star Wars, playing Finn. And one of the quotes that really stuck out to me, first of all, he's mad. And, and one of the reasons why is basically how his character was portrayed and how his arc kind of happened during Rise of Skywalker, especially. And what he said, the quote that stood out to me the most was when he said, and I'm quoting right now from from the article, he said, what I say to Disney is, do not market a black black character as important and then push them aside. Now, he was very clear, by the way, that he did not blame J.J. Abrams for any of this, by the way. So he wanted to make that very, very clear. So obviously he blames... It seems like, and I'm not going to put words in John Boyega's mouth, absolutely not, because he does a pl- pretty good job of <laughs> expressing himself. So it just seems like he's he's blaming, you know, partially the marketing and, and partially Disney for this as well. And and maybe the fact that, that this all started, by the way, in The Last Jedi, because obviously after, the, after Force Awakens, it kind of felt like Finn was going to be super important, right? It felt like Finn certainly had more of an arc than it would seem, right? Like there was more to Finn than the fact that he just used to be a stormtrooper. He didn't want, he didn't believe in what the First Order was doing anymore. So he basically defected. Well, he tried to abandon them and then he sort of defected out of default sort of thing. That that was part of it. I mean, however you want to describe how he left, he left, right? But it, it certainly became obvious, at least to me anyway, that there was going to be more to Finn than just that simple arc. Well, then you get to Rise of Skywalker, fast forward, and it's like, so he's spending part of the movie as like a lovesick puppy dog for for Rey, and then he's a sidekick at best 
at the end of the day, it was like, and you know what? Obviously, you know, I enjoyed the buddy stuff between Finn and Poe. I enjoyed that, the, the, the bromance that they had together. And their scenes together were amazing. And yes, Finn certainly had his moments in Last Jedi and in Rise of Skywalker. But you built him up. And then you kind of didn't do anything with it. And that was one of my things that that always left me scratching my head about Rise of Skywalker. It's like, you, you did all this with Finn and then you just kind of decided to not? I mean, did you change your mind or something? I don't know exactly... What's going on here? So I'm not saying that I necessarily agree with everything he says. But the man certainly got a point. And he also talked about how he received death threats and DMs and stuff because stormtroopers can't be black and all these other things. And I'm like, you know what? Are we ever going to grow up, you know, as a society, certain people in society, are we ever going to grow up and just get past this stuff? It's just frustrating for me that we're still hearing stories like this. I don't understand why we don't have enough adults in society. I really I really just don't. I don't understand why somebody like John Boyega still has to experience something like this. It's absolutely ridiculous and, and unacceptable that he could, that he would ever in DM or in any form would have to deal with stuff like that. But I mean back to his point about the character, you you can't deny that he has one. And whether or not you thought Finn should have been an important character in the first place, is immaterial. That's what they were given to. That was what was given to us. That was what was shown to us. It was like, this character is going to be more than you think he is. And then they just kind of didn't do anything with that. And that's, and that is, and therein lies his frustration. And tell me I'm wrong about that because I think that I, I think that he's right. I think that I'm right. I think that they just decided one day they woke, it's almost like one day they woke up and went, you know what? Yeah, we're not going to do that anymore. And obviously, John Boyega is going to earn a lot from being in these Star Wars movies, right? There's no question about that. But that doesn't that doesn't alleviate his frustration. Dollar signs do not alleviate frustration, and I think that that needs to be said. Sure, he's going to make a ton of money from being in a Star Wars movie, but at the same time, that he was obviously passionate about being a part of this franchise, and then it didn't quite measure up to exactly where he thought it was going to be based on the information that he was given and everything that he had seen initially. So I understand his frustration. I understand fans' frustration in joining him as well. Obviously, nothing you can really do about it now. He's kind of done with it. They all sort of are at this point. So what's done is done, sure, but it just it felt like this could have ended differently. Obviously, this was always going to be... Ray and Ben Solo's story, right? It seemed like this was just going to be their story from the beginning. And I I'm, I don't disagree with that, by the way. I don't think that it shouldn't have been Ray and Ben's story. But don't dangle the carrot of Finn is something way more than you think he is and then don't do anything with it. And, th- and then don't pay, pay that off because I absolutely think that they didn't do that. So, I, I, again, I think the man has a point, if nothing else. And I think you've got to, if, even if you don't agree with everything he says, you have to give him that much. There's no question about that. Here's something very interesting that came out, and I'm actually not surprised about this at all. This according to Variety, and that is that Sony Pictures Television is working on a live-action TV show centered around the Spider-Man character, Silk. And it's very, very early in development, but Phil Lord and Chris Miller are going to be the executive producers. Well, well, well. And apparently Lauren Moonson talks to write the show as well. So, I mean, they're obviously going to be looking for a Korean actor, a Korean-American actor to play the character of Silk. And, And it's way too early to speculate on the casting there, but it looks like, you know, Amazon might be the home for the show as well, which is very, very interesting choice given the fact that, you know, it's Sony. It's almost like Sony goes out of their way to make sure that they don't have this on any Disney networks. And I quite frankly, I can't blame them. Look at how Marvel stuff gets canceled on Freeform and on pretty much every other network all of the time. So why not find a home that might be a little bit better suited for this, but you know, we were kind of wondering. This has kind of been danced around a little bit. This female-centered Marvel series that's been talked about. We were wondering, you know, is it going to be Ghost Spider? Is it going to be Spider Woman? Is it going to be Silk? Well, it looks like 
it's going to be Silk. And I, I don't have any problem with that whatsoever. It's very interesting character. Cindy Moon is, is, has always been a very interesting character with, and she, the costume is amazing. So that's going to be looking really good on the screen. And, and I think that this is an arc that certainly deserves to be told. I think that TV series is a much smarter route than movie too, by the way, not because I don't think this character can carry her own movie, but more so because like, why put that kind of pressure on the character, right? Let's have this be a TV series and a TV series on a streaming service, by the way, that might be able to push the envelope a little bit. And then I know everybody's going to say, well, you know, is Tom Holland going to be in it? And is all these other people? Don't, let's, how about we don't worry about that? How about we don't worry about whether or not Spider-Man's going to be in this thing? And let's just see if they can tell a good story first. How about we just do that? How about we establish the character who's actually the, in the title of the series and then maybe worry about an occasional pop-in cameo from a character that you might know. Or you know what? Maybe this is a chance to expand the universe of the Sp- of the S- of Spider-Man and maybe go a little bit beyond things that you might know already and open your mind up about a completely different character who has by the way had her own own ongoing comic series too by the way at Marvel. This is a character that can easily carry a TV series. And if they want to do a Spider-Woman movie with Olivia Wilde, that's that's certainly within their realm if they want to do that. If they want to do a Ghost Spider, Spider-Gwen, whatever you want to call her, you want to call you want to make a movie about her, knock yourself out. We've already seen her in Into the Spider-Verse, by the way. So, I think that this is certainly a character that I think that this is very smart move to do this as a TV series. And I'm I'm obviously interested and where this is going to go. And I'm interested to find out whether or not Amazon's confirmed as the home, because then you've got Amazon who's kind of dipping its toe into all these different avenues of fandom and laughing all the way to the bank. Quite frankly, it's like they're getting all of the superhero stuff that Netflix isn't getting, even though Netflix has got a pretty good thing of their own going on right now. It's just going to be an interesting battle to see who wins out for this one. Speaking of Netflix, I want to comment on something that I'm seeing a lot on social media, and I, and I got to put this thing to rest. And that's the fact that everybody seems to be mad about Cobra Kai being delayed, season three being delayed until 2021. And I hear all the whining about how, well, they're done filming already, and they have all the episodes, and why don't you just put it out? Blah, 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 blah. I'll tell you why. First of all, raise your hand and honk your horn if you had YouTube bread. If you had the YouTube service, whatever they called the extra service, I'm pretty sure it was YouTube Red, where you got to see the original series. And they had a couple of good ones, obviously the best one being Cobra Kai. Yeah, I didn't think you did. And a lot of people didn't. You know how many millions of people have never seen an episode of Cobra Kai and have only heard about it secondhand from those of us who actually spent the money just to watch Cobra Kai? No, there's plenty of people that haven't seen it. And that's evidenced by the fact that seasons one and two were number one on Netflix upon their debut. It was the number one show in that top 10 list. Surprise, surprise, surprise. Everybody wants to watch this show now that it's on Netflix. You don't understand that this show might have been a cult hit with YouTube, but that show alone wasn't even enough to keep that YouTube original series thing afloat, okay? And no one series can carry an entire service. We know that for a fact. We've seen that happen. So, quite frankly, I, I don't understand what the whining is about this. Let's let this, these millions of fans catch up a little bit, and then we can go ahead and release Season 3, and it'll be bigger and badder than it would have been if you'd have just released all three seasons now. And that's the thing that I think people don't understand. Well, you know, if people already wanted to watch it, why not just release them all now? Because you got it's called generating hype. That's why you're generating hype for what's going to be this big reveal about when they're going to have season three. And they already gave you a little tease. We could it looks like, you know, Chozan might be part of season three of Cobra Kai. That was a bit of a surprise. I would love to see that if that's the case. We know that maybe Miyagi had a secret that he kept from Daniel. There's a whole bunch of stuff that we're about to explore in this third season. So you get a little taste of what's to come, but you also give the other fans 
a chance to catch up. It's called not being selfish, basically. And I understand wanting to see season three. I, I cannot wait to see season three. But at the same time, I get what they're doing. And if what they're doing is generating so much hype that that means we end up getting a season four, five, six, maybe spinoff series or whatever, then I'm all for it. Let's just let this happen organically because guess what? Netflix kind of knows what they're doing. They kind of know how to generate buzz about their shows, especially shows that they have just acquired. So let's let them do their work. And maybe they want to polish things up a little bit since they weren't involved in the production of season three. Maybe they want to edit it differently. Maybe they want to go back in and look at things. I don't know. There's a million different reasons why you delay this a little bit longer. So, yeah, can we just let them do their thing and just trust in what they're doing? Because I think that they've kind of earned that at this point. Really quickly, I want to make sure you know this in case you missed it. The Mandalorian Season 2 is going to be coming out on October the 30th of this year. So there's something that you won't have to wait until 2021 for. You'll get to see The Mandalorian the day before Halloween. So it's almost like The Mandalorian is premiering on All Hallows' Eve. Think about that for a second, right? That's, that's a pretty cool deal. And then I want you to think about all the cute baby Yoda costumes that you're going to be seeing walking down the streets during trick-or-treating. Hopefully there actually is trick-or-treating because there, if there isn't, then my son, my wife, my entire family might just explode. We are going to absolutely have Halloween in some way, shape, or form. I don't know if it's just going to be, you know, grabbing candy from the end of the street or something like that, but we're having Halloween. I'm just letting you know that right now. That's going to do it for this week's edition of the Down and Nerdy Podcast. Again, thank you so much to all the amazing guests that I had this week, whether it was from Raised by Wolves or, or Jun Yu from Mulan. So many amazing guests. You want to find out more about everything that goes on on this show and past shows, things like that, go to downandnerdypodcast.com. Also, follow along on social media as well. We're at downandnerdy757 on Twitter and on Instagram and at downandnerdy on Facebook. Remember, you never have to apologize for being a nerd, so let your fan flag fly and be good to your fellow nerds.